Ever since November 9th, I have received 18 requests, 18 separate requests on the email for an interview with Dr. James Mori of Centum Investments. And uh, I must apologize to all our viewers. I said that um, they were in their closed period. The half year earnings were coming up. That was the best time to have a conversation. And we are privileged to have Dr. James on set. Welcome. Thank you, Julian. It's always a pleasure. Asante Sanat Nashkuru. Let's dig into the half year numbers you've just released. Your loss after tax trimmed quite significantly. When I look at the numbers, the portfolio companies especially, I struggle with the efficiency question in the business. Let me just walk you through this. Trading business operating costs are up 116%. Financial services costs are up 29%. Real estate up 45%. Two Rivers development down 17%, quite impressive. Uh, investment operations, operations and admin costs are up 13%. Finance costs are down 28%. From an efficiency standpoint, um, how would you assess the business? Uh, Julian, that's a good question. What about the profitability? If you looked at the profitability growth of the companies, you know, the, the focus of any business is to make a profit, not yeah. to cut costs, you know. Costs are enablers of, of, of a business. And uh, all these businesses, if you look at them, the reason to your point to why the performance has improved is because the operating profitability of the companies have come has significantly improved. And the key thing is that revenue has grown much faster than costs. And these businesses in, in COVID, they had a significant retrenchment of costs. So we, we moved very quickly to cut costs to bring them in line with the revenue, but still revenues came down so significantly that we ended up with losses so that revenues were below fixed costs. There's only so much we could cut, but once business starts coming back, our foot as a portfolio manager for a lot of these businesses, we want revenue, we want bottom line back because the driver of value in all these businesses is, is, is a profit after tax. So the way we do our evaluations, the major driver is on profitability basis. So the critical thing is how quickly can you optimize your profitability back to where you ought to be and make up for lost lost ground while remaining efficient. So for me and for the entire team, you know, we are happy that, you know, we are encouraged with the progress. We are encouraged with the progress around, uh, around profitability for each of the companies and actually all the companies had improved, uh, had improved profitability. I think the second thing is that for business like Centamri, the issue they have with their cost structure is that the majority of their profitability is deferred in the sense that you're incurring costs today for projects which you've substantially sold, but where you'll recognize profit in the future. So when you're looking at their p and there's a mismatch between revenue recognition and expense recognition. The expense recognition is coming up front. And as they have ramped up activity, you have increased costs. And all those costs go through their p and in the in the period that they are incurred even though then revenue is recognized, at the point when that particular unit is sold, completed, handed over. That's the other issue. The second issue in that business is that the bulk of the profitability on the sale of development rights has been booked in the previous periods through revaluation gains. So when you then sell, you are then the, base, the cost basis is not the original cost. The cost basis is the most recent revaluation. Now, because you've done a very recent revaluation, it's very difficult to sell at a value significantly higher than that revaluation. So although you have a huge cash profit, that cash profit is not cycling through your P&L. So Centambri sort of gives you a distorted uh, efficiency, efficiency metric. I think moving on to Centum as an investment company, which is important, and I think in our last discussion, we had a conversation around this. Our cost to income ratio was 44%. So we have investment income coming into Centum. And then for every 100 shillings that was coming in, we we're spending 44 shillings last time when we met. We are now down to 30 shillings. We've done further reorganization of our business. My own target is to bring this to like 20 shillings of the investment income that comes in. So that then the 80 is available either for reinvestment or paying our shareholders uh, shareholders dividend. 
James, I think one of the bright spots I saw in these numbers released uh, this morning is on the marketable securities. And my question to you is, the last conversation we had, the target for the market, marketable securities is about 20%, yes. and uh, you're already at 9%. 19%, sorry. Is uh, it a, the 20% a moving target, especially because when you look at the environment outside, mm -hmm. Fixed income is giving increasingly attractive yields from the government side, and we are seeing a lot of investment grade corporate paper now coming in. Yeah. Uh, Julian, look, in, in, I say investment is like, is like dancing, you know? You have to dance to the tune of the music being played. And the tune, in this case, is the outlook on the economic environment. So if I look back to 2009, the outlook was such that we felt that there were going to be more growth opportunities investing in, in, in businesses for capital growth than investing in fixed income for, for, for a fixed rate of return. In fact, in that environment, we were an issuer of government securities as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an investment company. We issued a bond in 2012, we issued another bond in 2015. Why? Because we believed that there was more value to be created by borrowing at 13% and redeploying it for, 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 for capital, for capital growth. I think coming into 2018, 2017, our view was that the way the economy was behaving and the signals we were seeing was that that was ne not necessarily going to be the case going forward and that we needed to dial down on risk and take our winnings where we had winnings, reduce, so shift from being an, an issuer of, of debt to a provider of, 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 of debt, and then shift the P&L structure. Because if then you believe there are not going to be room for huge capital gains, then our P&L up, up, up until then had a significant line income on gains on disposal because as you as you as you as you as you make the as you create the value, you then realize it through the exits. If you believe that going forward that is going to be a muted line, then our view was then to shift the the, the allocation towards investments that would generate a cash yield to replace the gains on disposal that we thought were not going to happen as had happened in the in, in, in the past. And so we, we, we made a decision to move our fixed income. At that time, our marketable securities portfolio was only 3% of total assets. And even that marketable securities was largely in quoted equities. So we have gone all the way to 20%. Now, this half here alone, we also we further, we further increased. So we continue to see opportunities in that segment of the market. Our, our average cash yield is now 15%. On, on, on cash only, which is even higher than our borrowing cost because our effective borrowing cost is 12%. So as we continue to see opportunities in that space, uh, we'll continue to, to deploy capital, capital there. And given the work that has been done around reduction of, 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 of interest expenses, of operating costs, dividend is at 30%, we expect to have surplus cash. And, and that surplus cash can then either be redeployed into, into MSP or into PE when you get the right, the right opportunity. On the call, you spoke about uh, seeing monetizing events for mature assets. Yeah. And my question to you is, uh, we've had a conversation about Centamri before. Mm -hmm. Beyond Centamri, are you seeing any such opportunities in the medium term at least? In, in the investment world, and, and, and maybe we'll come to that question later, in, in, in my world, I, I've been CEO of this business since December 2008. The way we've grown the business is by investing, growing value, exiting, and redeploying the capital. That's how we've moved assets from slightly less than six billion to where they are today. So you always have to have your mind, if you're the CEO of this business, about value creation and exit for all your assets. You always have to think about the exit because the, the assets you have are your working capital. So if you don't have an exit, it means your capital is then, is then, is, is then stuck. And so we're always having, at any given time, uh, an exit conversation, potential exit conversation taking place. And, and what we've done for all our assets is that we have mapped what is our break-even exit value based on the value creation plan 
if today you gave an offer for any asset, we have, a, we have an exit value that has been approved by the FIC for all our assets. 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, we have a break-even value. And we are a seller at any value above, above, above that. Because holding it above that means that we cannot, we are then earning a return lower than the cost of capital. So that's sort of how we were doing at it. So for St. Ambri, we did communicate to the market that we wanted to bring in a minority equity investor into the business. Our investment this is has always been around creating investment grade assets. And because we were very constrained for capital at the beginning, we then had to do to, to, to actually originate these assets from, from scratch and build them all the way to be corporate enterprises and then bring in investors at a value uplift. And we are having very interesting conversations with a number of investors who like that particular asset. It is moved from being bare land to an asset with financial assets, financial receivables, whether it's in the form of profitability on, on deferred profitability on infield developments or, uh, or receivables on sale of development rights. So it's, it's an entity um, that is playing a significant role in uh, development of affordable and medium income housing across the region. And there's a lot of interest in that particular, in that particular space. And uh, maybe in the, sh in, in, the, in, the, in the short run, we may be able to make an announcement okay. around what has happened around that, that asset. In terms of getting a minority investor, we expect, we, we intend to continue to hold it because it has been one of our more successful investments and we still see a lot of potential in that, in that business going forward. You've spoken about the finance costs and uh, something of deep interest to me, James. Um, I've been combing through the centum yeah. evolution of the strategy, yeah. 1.0, 2.0, yeah. 3.0. And I have a question for you, James. My own assessment is that centum should have gone for an equity raise. Yes. And uh, why that would be ideal in my view, yeah. it would enable you to cushion some of these heavy finance costs. If I walked you through the finance costs, they're crazy. Yeah, yeah. What, we've, what we've spent in the last... Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So why wasn't that an option on the table? And more importantly, was there fear of dilution uh, by strategic investors, key investors if I could call them? Because that for me would have been a very optimal capital structure. That's true, Julian. You know, every CEO, ask any CEO, they would love to have more equity in their business. Yeah, it's, you see, as a CEO, I am hired by my principal to deliver their mandate within the constraints that you have. So when I was recruited in December 2008, the mandate I got, we want you to grow the business. And I asked the question uh, when we had our strategic retreat in uh, January of 2009, are the shareholders going to put in more capital? And they said, no, James, we have no more capital to put into this business, okay? Can I go out and raise more equity capital? This is no, we don't wish to be diluted. So what can I do? You can borrow, and you can retain the dividend for the first five years. So, so you, you work within, you dance within the tune that you've been given and you perform within those constraints. So when I took over this business as CEO, there was exactly 10 million shillings of cash in the balance sheet. If you had gone back to 2009, there was 10 million shillings of cash in the balance sheet. There was an overdraft of 180 million shillings. And there was 5 billion of assets, largely made up of illiquid uh, minority stakes in a range of companies. And the vision was we want you to move this balance sheet to 30 billion. And you cannot raise equity. We are not going to put in equity. You can borrow. And that's what I signed up to do. And that's what I've been doing. That was my, that was my brief, yes. is to then work within those constraints, go to the market, borrow, invest, grow the value, exit, pay the debt, and leave a residual equity, create value for us. And I delivered with my management team to the best of my ability. We moved uh, book value of shareholder funds from less than five billion to what it is today, close to 40 billion, uh, 40 billion shillings. We've not raised a shilling of equity capital. 
uh, we've distributed 4.1 billion shillings in dividend. Yes, we incurred very heavy finance costs, but that was a price the shareholders were prepared to pay for growth because they were not putting in any money of their own. They were riding that particular wave. And at the end of 2019, the mandate then was, you've done your job well. Now we want you to pay down this debt that you've taken over the period. We did that within two years, 2019, 2020. It's negative. Today, our marketable securities net the debt is a positive 3.5 billion shillings. So I wish I had more equity. It would have been a more comfortable uh, uh, job for me. Uh, I wish I was investing uh, in private equity. Plus, remember, then you're taking additional risk of now having debt invested in an illiquid asset class yes. uh, where Africa PE industry most G investors will tell you the biggest challenge they have is, is, is exits. Now, when you've issued a bond and the redemption of the bond is dependent upon you creating value in a company and exiting, and you have a hard redemption, you can imagine the stress you face. Plus, you then have quarterly uh, interest, interest payments. So that has been the performance of the business within those constraints. And for me, I'm glad, by and large, we delivered on that mandate. We, we, we've delivered on that mandate. The new mandate is now grow using your internal funds. We are still not out there raising equity capital. There's no intention to raise equity capital. Grow using your internal funds. And in 2014, to your point, rather than raise equity, which, we, which I agree with you we ought to have done, we actually reinstated the dividend policy. So we still had a huge growth amb ambition with dividend, with debt service, and uh, we've delivered what we've delivered. So I'm, I'm glad you've gone back to look at the financials, how the business has been, has been funded. And you see, I tell a lot of investors who ask me, I say, none of you has put in any money. I've not taken anybody's money. I, I, I took the 10 million shillings. There were 80 million shillings. Everyone we've borrowed, we've paid back. And we are where we are. We've created value. Yes, we have a price to NAV gap mismatch. But I'm glad it's not the other way around. I'm glad we don't have a lower NAV and a higher price, because that then is not grounded on fundamentals. I think this might be an easier problem to fix than if it was a converse. So James, let me walk you back to your younger self back in 2009, the retreat. Um, if you're given a chance to go back, would you have done things differently? Would you have told them, guys, this is what makes sense, keep your job? No, I would not have done anything, anything differently. You see, I, I, I believe you're never in a perfect world. You know, you work within the constraints that you have. It's very important to understand the constraints of your stakeholders. And I had a fantastic working relationship with my key shareholders for that reason is that once you understand your mandate, you deliver to the mandate. So the role of any investment manager, you deliver to the mandate of the client. I have a client here, they have a mandate. My responsibility is, to, I believed I could deliver to the mandate, and my responsibility was to build a management team that delivered on that mandate, and I'm proud that with what we've delivered. Of course, it would have been more comfortable if we had equity capital. Then the timing of our exits would not be under as much, as much pressure. But that was, not, that was not the mandate I had. So no, I would not have done anything differently because this is the opportunity I had. And, and, and that's the opportunity I grasped within the mandate that, I, that was presented to me. The June 2020 retirement of debt, um, was it the best solution? Because you have made exits, you have this cash. You're getting into a, what I think is a very capital intensive phase you've got. Uh, two rivers, etc. Um, could you have stepped back on the retirement of the debt? You see, the issue of debt is that you're accruing... The challenge with, uh, with private equity or equity investments is that you have a yield 
that is significantly lower than the interest yield on the debt. So the, the average cash yield on our, on our portfolio, the assets we've exited, is not more than 3%. But you're accruing interest at 13%. Some of the debt is also foreign denominated. So it might be 7%, but if you add the currency risk, it might be going to like 10, 10 it might be going to 17%. So for me, the risk I was looking at is we had worked for 10 years. I don't want the capital we've built over 10 years to be eroded by, by underperformance in the next two, where this debt now grows faster than the, than the asset, and you end up wiping the equity. So you, you get to a point where you're now on capital preservation mode. Largely because then you look at the economic conditions, the economic conditions supportive of an aggressive strategy. At that time, we did not even know there was going to be COVID. So this was pre-COVID. So if you take into account then COVID happened, I'm glad we did not take that 19 billion and redeploy to another asset. Because maybe now that 19 would be five. And then you still have the debt now that has moved from 19 to say 24, plus you have debt service. So I think there's a time to be aggressive. There's a time to be cautious. And you need to read the environment you are in, you're going into carefully. So I, in my view, uh, even with the benefit of hindsight, I think it was the best decision. I'm glad we did not deploy that capital to more risky ventures because even the shareholders who are left in the business we exited, they're still trying to exit today at a lower value than what we exited at two, three years ago. In the interim, we've saved significant amounts in, uh, in, 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 in finance costs. So the, the, the strategy come 2017 was you've created value. Now preserve that value. That, 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 that was a game plan. And then now reward your shareholders sustainably using your recurrent income. So that whether you have an exit or no exit, you can afford to pay a dividend. That's why the dividend is at 30% of investment income. So grow that recurrent investment income. The assets you have try and increase value. And if you can, work on a monetization event so that then you can recycle that capital back into new opportunities. Okay. Looking at the business now from a debt service coverage ratio standpoint, how comfortable would you say you are today? No, you just need to look at our half year performance. Our interest expense is 200 million investment income is a billion, so it's 20%. If you look at uh, marketable securities only, 7.8 billion, debt is 4 billion, net is 3.8 billion. Go back, uh, go back 26, 2017, debt was 19 billion, marketable securities 3 billion. We had, a, we, had a, we had a mismatch, we had a liquidity mismatch of 16 billion. The, the, the income, the larger income that we were working on was, was, cap, was gains on disposal. But that is because the environment allowed for you to operate that way. Today, the environment does not allow you to have those kind of gains because multiples have also come down. So five years ago, no, in 2018, we could sell an asset for 10 and a half times EBITDA. Today, PEs, price to earnings ratio that five times, let alone EV, enterprise value, EBITDA, EBITDA multiples. So I think, look, th this business is difficult because you also have to read the environment. Yeah. And you're in, you're in an environment where there's so many variables uh, all happening at the, at, the, at the same time. So I think we made the right decision. You see, look, as I told you in, uh, when we met six months ago, my objective um, with the chairman of the FIC, the late Chris Kirubi, into coming into 4.0 was let's dial down risk in this business. We, we, we've had a good run. We've created value. Let us secure that value. So that whoever comes and runs this business finds a steady, a steady business. And that's what we're working into because we looked at the environment and said, look, the environment may not be as benign as it has been in the past. And, and the past allowed us opportunities to create considerable value, but also to take bets that may not necessarily have worked. You had that, that comfort that the upside on, on what worked would offset what did not, did not work. Maybe the environment you're going into may not be as, as, as benign, and that's what we've seen since 2019 with COVID, the economic challenges we've had, the reduction in market multiples, 
the reduction. So there's been a whole host of challenges. Uh, still going back to the centum strategy, one of the um, investments which I have struggled with uh, in my reviews is the Akira investment. Yeah. And the reason is you are going into an extremely capital intensive area which uh, is not centum's core business if I could put it. And also the fact that if you look at other players, the main players in that space, they benefit from a lot of concessional financing. So they can take on that risk. How is it doing? And when you look back, um, are you happy with it? You know, Julians, the, these are decisions, these are things you can look at with the benefit of hindsight. You have to play back when that decision was made. That decision was made in 2013. In 2013, 2012, 2013, I still remember that uh, when we presented this opportunity to the Finance and Investment Committee meeting, there was a huge demand for power. Uh, Kenya had this idea around 5,000 uh, megawatts. Uh, Akira had been, at, they had been at it for a while. They obviously had a PPA. They have a concession area which is just next to, to Alcaria. Uh, all the studies showed, look, the significant uh, geothermal resources here. We had investors who were just prepared to come in after we got 25 megawatts. So we're going to unsell our stake. So our two billion investment, we had a pre-exit of 3X. And uh, we had a very experienced driller. We also took insurance against the, the, you know, the drilling risk. So, you, you know, in, in business, you mitigate your risks. But the reason you make 3x is because there's also risk. Uh, you don't have a 3x investment for no, for no risk. If we had come later, whoever was coming later, they were coming in at an IRR of 12%. That, that is not an exciting IRR. For us, it was an early stage investment, which was the kind of deals we liked, we liked to do. So we tried to mitigate our investment to the greatest extent possible. So with the information we had then, I think it was the right decision. How is it doing now? Uh, I still think that for, my view is that for Kenya as a country to reduce its cost of power, the only solution is to develop the naturally occurring power sources within your own country. People talk about Egypt's uh, lower advantage, power advantage, but that is because it's largely uh, hydro, which they have in large quantities, some of it is LNG, which again they have in large quantities, or, or South Africa, it is coal. What here we have in large quantities is, is geothermal. So if we develop our geothermal, then you can replace expensive HFO and other sources of power because you don't need to import the fuel cost element. The fuel cost element is the most important element. So my view is that geothermal has a very critical space in the development of power for this country into the future. We have a good field. We only ran into challenges around the original process of drilling. So it was more of a drilling process challenge rather than a lack of a reserve issue. And we are now in advanced discussion with a partner to work with to do a joint development of the field. And this is a partner who has a competitive advantage on the geothermal development process. So just taking a bit longer. But I think that is the nature of, uh, of geothermal, is that sometimes it may not happen as fast as you expect, but the field we have is fantastic. It is part of the whole career field. I think there's demand because you are, you are, you are displacing more expensive power. It is, uh, it is green energy. And I think government ought to, because if you look at an organization like GDC, which has been funded at taxpayers' cost, and they have amazing equipment. There's no reason why we should be spending a lot of money as private developers to develop geothermal field, which will then save the country for an exchange of importing HFO. I think there's need for government to come and support developers in the development phase of geothermal because you're developing a country's natural resource and you can even offset that from the tariff. So at the end, the tariff, what you're left with, is the cost of the plant itself, rather than the cost of the, of the, you know, of the drilling. So it's, it's what Chris used to say, uh, you know, you're in such a place, to go back you can't, to go forth you must. So that's what we have with, with some of these opportunities. <laughs>
You've reminded me, when I was assessing the evolution from Centum 2.0 to 3.0, and speaking about the capital constraints, one of the challenges that I had was reconciling the 2.0 agenda of, uh, in the real estate space, identifying undervalued assets, getting in, and then now you come in with the two rivers and very heavy infra. Yeah. Why that? No, you see, when we started 2.0, that was the idea. You know, you have, you have a hypothesis, yeah? But then you go to the ground. The ground is different. So you went to the ground, there was no... What we realized, there was going to be no competitive advantage for us to go and buy an acre in Kilimani and develop it. We are not going to be competitive. Our procurement processes, our structurement, that we could not compete with Julian's as, a, as an individual. We then said, look, we need to do real estate development at scale because then there we have less competition. So when you came to Two Rivers, the idea was develop the concept and bring other investors in. So if you look at Two Rivers, Centum is one that has invested the least. But we brought in investors at a value uplift. So the capital that is at risk is the one that you brought in to do the, 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 the investment. Yeah? But then also there were lessons learned. By the time we went to Vipingo, which is even much larger than, uh, than Two Rivers, the idea had changed because you, you, know, you learn. We said, let's not front load uh, infrastructure. Let us front load what is bringing money, which is the infill development. And even that infill will now not build before we pre-sell. Let us pre-sell and then build and then do the, let the infrastructure be the last thing you, you bring in. That's why that particular investment has been a lot more successful than this investment. So there's also been uh, a learning curve uh, in what we have, we have done. Now, that is the plight of entrepreneurs because you are charting a new path. No one had done what we were doing before, but we thought there was a need for you to have uh, spaces like this where there's high quality infrastructure, where there are services. Uh, we also knew we did not have the capital so we had to go and raise the capital up front, equity capital. Unfortunately, what happened, even with Two Rivers, the intention was to have all the infrastructure equity funded. But as is the nature of this thing, you end up with cost overrun, so you end up with debt, and that's the debt we are now trying to refinance with equity. It still works. There's still a huge equity, equity value within the, within the company. But that's the nature of entrepreneurship. Yeah, if, somebody, if, if, if we were following today like a follower, we would have done it differently because we would have had another entity that has done it before us that we could, we could study. But we all appreciated, look, we, we, this is what we're going to do. And to your point, this is, we, we've always done things that are not in our circle of competence. Centum is a confident entity. It's an entity that believes they can succeed in different areas. We, we have never done anything in real estate before. Um, and now we are one of the largest players in that, uh, in that, in the, in that field. And we are also very nimble Maybe in two years' time we'll have exited completely and we'll be in something uh, totally, totally different. So that is the nature of what this organization was all, you know, has been uh, all about. And that's why for me it has been extremely enjoyable.